So at the local level, how does any one church accomplish the Great Commission in a city and a county our size? Of course, the answer is that it can't. It takes all churches working together in order to accomplish the Great Commission. And that's really the focus of the association. That's what UBA is all about. It's about bringing churches together to accomplish the Great Commission. We work to equip churches and pastors to get them working in relationships with one another. In fact, you're part of an association that trains more than 100 Hispanic pastors every year in order to accomplish that goal. You're part of an association that works with dying and declining churches to help rekindle the lamps in those neighborhoods and to keep the gospel alight in those places. You're part of an association that brings pastors into relationships so that when the times are tough, they have relationships to fall back on. The Global Missions offering goes directly to UBA because UBA is funded, 95% of our budget is funded by churches and individuals just like you. And we're so grateful for your support. Thanks so much for joining us for our online worship experience today. If you're a guest, I want to make sure you know a little bit about us before we get started. City Rise Network is a partnership of church campuses, nonprofits, and international missionaries committed to lifting our city and the world by generously giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have physical church campuses around Houston and West University Place and Bel Air, and a new campus coming soon in Missouri City. If you'd like to join us in person, check out our websites for service times and locations. This online worship experience is our digital worship gathering for those in our church family across the city and the world. In just a moment, we're going to sing some songs of praise to God and then open up his word as one of our teaching pastors guides us through a passage of scripture. If you've never filled out a connect card digitally or in person, we invite you to text the word connect to 797979 which allows us to send you a quick online form that helps us get to know you better. During this time, we encourage you to sing out in worship and take notes during the teaching, fully engaging in the worship experience wherever you are. If you're watching as this experience premieres, a team member will be in the chat window if you have any needs, questions, prayer requests, or if you just want to interact with other church family members as we worship together. If you have private prayer requests you'd like to share with our team, you can text the word CONNECT to 797979 and use the form that is sent to you to share your needs and concerns with our team who prays over requests weekly. Before we get started with worship, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for drawing us together during this time. As we are celebrating Advent, God, we're just thankful for Jesus coming um, as a little baby so many years ago and then growing, living a perfect life and dying for our sins and rising on the third day, um, proving um, that resurrection is in store for each of us that puts our faith in him. Uh, help us focus on him during these next few moments as we sing, as we learn about um, what the teaching is going to be today. Help us to remember Christ and use whatever happens today to make us more like him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God continues to expand the reach of the City Rise Network in our city and the world through incredible opportunities for ministry that He is making available to us. We believe that God is using our church and partners to lead people to Christ and are so thankful for your continued partnership in the gospel. Scripture is clear that we have the privilege to offer our finances to be part of God's kingdom work. And we'd like to take a moment to provide you the opportunity to worship God through giving tithes and offerings to His work through the City Rise Network. If you're a guest, our primary goal is to simply get to know you. So take this time to text the word CONNECT to 797979 as your gift today. Before we give, let's pray. Join me. Father, we're so grateful for the evidence of your work in our lives, in our church, in our city because of the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to be faithful stewards of that gospel message. Help us to carry it in us everywhere we go. But especially in this moment, help us to be mindful of the need for us to be generous toward the going out of your gospel. Help us to give of our finances in a way that will have a meaningful impact to the city and the world because of our ability to take your message to those who haven't heard. Use these gifts, expand them to glorify yourself, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
This is the story of a ragtag bunch of church members who set out to perform a Christmas play, and the director who tried his hardest to just keep it all together. The Glory of Christmas. My name's Joseph, and in the Christmas nativity play, The Glory of Christmas, I play Joseph. That's right, I was born to play this role. Joseph has no clue what to do when it comes to babies. So, in order for him to play the role of Joseph, we got him an infant simulator doll from the local home act teacher. So, you know, he could practice a bit. It's an insane shriek it's a baby. It's a burp. It's a burp? Oh, so, put your fingers under and try to find the. Where's the spine on this thing? I don't know. And check the front. Joseph is terrified. I don't blame it. Babies don't even have kneecaps. Ha! <laughs> Burping like a boss? Uh, yeah, way to go, fake dad. I heard things may not be going so well with the infant simulator doll. Hey, Joseph, your mom's here to pick you up. Yeah. Coming. As you can see, my mom's house is full of antiques. So I did what any good home economics teacher would do. I sent Joseph home with a, a baby egg. I think about Joseph, like Bible Joseph, a lot. What it would have been like for him to have an angel come and tell him that his wife is pregnant with God's child. Ha! Like he would have had to really dig deep and find his, his compassion and his understanding, because he really, really loved her. My dear Mary, it is going to be a long journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem for the census, especially with your belly being so humongous. With, 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 with child, Joseph, the line is being with child. <sighs> right. Sorry, ma'am. Is the age difference what's bothering you? I want you to know, it doesn't bother me. It's... Okay, please people, let's just take it from the top. I understand that Joseph is radically underqualified for all he's about to encounter. But isn't that the type of people God uses? The most unlikely folks to do the biggest things? Yeah. <laughs> Seems like those are the ones he always picks because he's a God that'll never give up on us. Ah! Ha-ha! Yes! Ha-ha! I have we need to get I have swaddled! Ha! Hey, it's good to be with you today. Thank you for joining us here on our YouTube channel for this time of worship. I hope you like that Skit Guys vignette, The Glory of Christmas. Uh, this one focused on Joseph. Uh, each of the characters are going to be featured along the way. Last week was Mary's. You might want to go watch that and pick up the message that uh, was shared by Robbie last week. But thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us. If you have your Bible, let's open to Matthew chapter 1, and I would like to lead us in prayer. Father, thank you for today, for the chance to open the Word of God together. Pray blessings, Lord, as we use this medium to uh, seek to feed and nourish and to be fed. And so, Lord, use this today. We pray. Teach us 
Lead us, guide us, watch over us. We pray for our city, our nation, the world, Lord, as we're responding to this virus, as it seems to be spiking and and we're struggling with it. Lord, we just pray your grace upon us. We pray for our, our doctors and our nurses and those on the front lines, our teachers, as they're navigating things differently. Lord, people who are learning at, at home, these students. And so, Father, we just lift them all to you. We pray your hand upon us. Lead us, guide us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me ask you a question. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. Now, But here's my question I want to start with. When you look back on 2020, how might you describe 2020 in one word? I've heard a few. I, I'll throw a few up here for you. Uh, some might say 2020 was awful. It was just awful. Others, horrible, right? Those are synonyms there. Others would say disruptive. I mean, our lives were disruptive. And I think we could all agree with that. Catastrophic is how you might uh, characterize it because of something that happened in your life this year and what you see in others. Um, now, whether it was awful or horrible or disruptive or, catastrophic, or or catastrophic or not, I think we could all agree that 2020 has been a year that is unprecedented. It has been unprecedented. Uh, the word unprecedented means never known or done before. It's an adjective. It's a descriptor. It's never known or done before. Now, that th this doesn't mean 2020 is possibly your worst year ever, right? Others have had bad years and, 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 and tough seasons. But from a, uh, the scope and size of this, we all could say, man, we've never seen relational stress, financial stress, physical stress, emotional struggle like we have this year as a nation, frankly, as a human race. This has been a year that has been unprecedented. I, I wonder if Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, would use the word unprecedented to talk about that night when he, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and told him to go ahead and marry, uh, take Mary as his wife. I wonder if he would say, you know, that was an unprecedented moment, and yet it changed my life and the trajectory forever. Let's take a look at this moment that seems so unprecedented in Joseph's life, and let's see what we can learn from it. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit." She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Can you imagine what Joseph was thinking? Can you imagine how knowing he's already disappointed, he's already heartbroken, he's already fearful to take Mary as his wife, this angel shows up to him in a dream and tells him to go ahead with his plans. This is wild. This is, this is life changing. It's hard to fathom. And as I said earlier, it's unprecedented. And here's what I want you to hear today. Here's what I want us to, to see today. I believe that Joseph shows us how to walk when the unprecedented occurs in our life. Joseph shows us how to navigate the unprecedented moment, season that we find ourselves in. So let me share my outline with you today. When the unprecedented occurs, we stand upon the foundation we've already been building. We have a decision to make. And we should look for the right next step. 
So when the unprecedented occurs, we stand upon the foundation we've already been building. We have a decision to make, and we should look for the next right step. So let's dig in to this as we study this portion. When the unprecedented occurs, number one, we stand upon the foundation we have already been building. Look again at verses 18 through 20. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, when the angel appears to Joseph, if you read this closely, you see and sense that Joseph already has knowledge that Mary is pregnant. Now, we don't know how far along that Mary was pregnant, but he already seems to have the knowledge because the, 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 the angel says, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Now, if you look at Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 1, after the angel visits Mary and she finds out that the Holy Spirit will conceive in her and she'll give birth, that she's going to become pregnant here, she then goes to be with her cousin Elizabeth and stays with her for three months. So clearly, we can assume that when Joseph finds this out, it's probably after the first trimester, after the first three months. Now, we don't know how he received the news. The last time he saw Mary was probably at the, uh, at the uh, agreement, the covenant, when it was established, when, when they became betrothed, because the man would go to this young woman's house and she, he would take a dowry, a large gift that he would give to her father for the right to marry her. And you better pay the right high price. He then would drink a cup of the covenant with the uh, bride-to-be, she would then put on a veil, and she would wear a veil anytime she went out of the house, indicating she was uh, engaged. She was betrothed. She was in a covenant relationship. And he would drink this cup of the covenant together with her. She would drink, he would drink, and he would say, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, and I'll come back to receive you when I'm ready to take you to be with me so that where I am, you may be also. There's this language, this beautiful covenant language they would use. So then he would leave and he would go to his father's home, whether it was his father's property, if his father was wealthy, or, or just to his father's home and begin to build uh, onto his father's home their own bedroom, their own wedding chamber, where they would spend the first seven days and where they would spend um, their days ahead. He would build this exactly to his father's specifications. And it wasn't until his father approved could he go and take his wife. And so envision this with me, Joseph finding out that Mary's pregnant. Joseph the carpenter, he might be up on a ladder and he's, he's working to, to build this wedding chamber for them just tried. And as he's, as he's coming down the ladder, he looks down the road and there's this, this young woman that he recognizes who's, who's wearing a veil and he sees from afar that she's pregnant. Hmm, that's odd. And he, he gets off his ladder, and as she gets closer, he realizes, oh, that's, that's Mary. And he has a moment, like, how am I going to respond? And he probably looks at her and says, Mary, Mary, what have you done? Why, why would you ever sleep with another man? Mary, what, what have you done? Look, you remember the, the dowry price I paid to be in covenant with you? You remember we, we drank the cup of the covenant. I said, I'm coming back. Mary, why would you ever violate the covenant? Look what I'm building for you, for us. And I'm sure that young teenage girl with her head hung low, she said, Joseph, Joseph, listen to me. It's not what you think. Joseph, this is not what you... And he turns his head because he doesn't want to react wrong. He's trying to control his emotions. And she, she blurts out the words, God's spirit has conceived in me and I'm going to give birth to the Christ. You have to believe me. 
But it's, it's unbelievable. It doesn't add up. His life has just been turned on its head. Everything he had been planning, everything he had been working towards has just been interrupted. It's not believable. It's unthinkable. And as a matter of fact, it's unprecedented. And he is having to respond. He's saying, I don't know that this adds up, Mary. So whether it was Mary that delivered the message, maybe it was Mary's father that delivered the message. When the angel comes to Joseph, Joseph's already wrestling with this. And when the unprecedented occurs, what are we to do? What did we say the first point was? We are to stand upon the foundation we've already been building. And what we see, the word says to us, is that Joseph was a just man. You see, when the unprecedented occurs, we stand upon the foundation we have been building upon, whether it's the right foundation or not. In Matthew chapter 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 26 and verse 27, we see these words. Jesus is speaking, and he says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Here Jesus is saying, I've given you my word. And you can build upon it by doing, what it's, by doing what it says. And when the rains come and the winds blow and the storm hits, you're going to stand. Or you can hear my word and do nothing about it. But the storm's coming. See, the principle here is that when the storm comes, your foundation's going to be exposed. That's why the, the search for divorce attorneys is going through the roof in, on the internet. That's why the divorce rate is up by 30, 34% in this pandemic, because people have not been prepared for the storm. They've not been building with the right materials. Their foundation, their character is exposed. It happens in the individual's life when the storm comes, in a marriage, in organizations. Notice what it says about Joseph's character. Verse 19 says he was a just man. Don't just fly past this description. He was a just man. This means that his character conformed to the standard, the will, and character of God. So what does it mean that we have a character that's conformed to the character and will and standard of God? It means that we fear God. It means that we, 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 we think about how God thinks of what we're about to do before we do it. We want to please Him. And this is the heart of Joseph. It, it means that, that we know God's going to hold us accountable for our decisions and for our actions. It means that we look at God's character and we want to emulate it. This is the heart of Joseph. And when that's your character, listen, you don't act hastily. He's a just man who wasn't acting hastily. Instead, he feared God and he wanted to make a decision that with which God would be pleased based on what has just come into his life that was unprecedented. See, we see the evidence of this character with the words, he's unwilling to put her to shame. At some point, he makes the decision, okay, I'm going to divorce her, and I'm going to try, to, to try my best to do it in a way that doesn't put her to shame, that doesn't expose her and her reputation to the public. It doesn't, it doesn't expose the illicit action to the public and to their scrutiny. I'm going to try to protect her. I don't want revenge. I don't want uh, to create further pain. I simply want the drama to end, and I want to move on with my life. And then after he's made this decision to divorce her quietly, what else do we see? It says in verse 20, as he considered these things, it means that he pondered and wrestled with, even after he's made the decision, he's still thinking about it. He's still processing it. He's still wondering deeply. Now, can I tell you something about what I found in my, to be true in my life? Maybe it's true in yours as well. When I stop and think about things that when they don't go my way and how I'm going to respond, instead of just reacting, I tend to respond better. I would bet you do as well. See, I, I regret the times when I let my emotion get the best of me. When I, when I get frustrated with the situation, uh, when, when something difficult comes and I just react 
I often have to go back and say, I am so sorry for the way I responded. Because I'll tend to hurt someone. I'll lose my way. I don't know if that's true of you, but, but, but here we see Joseph taking his time to consider, right? He's building on the foundation of being a just man who, who has the heart and character of God. He's not wanting to put her to shame. He's, he's still pondering these things, even after he's made this decision. And then one other thing I want to point out before we move to the next point, and this is us backing up from the text just a little bit. Joseph is about to play the leading man, the leading role in this cosmic drama playing out where Jesus is coming to be the Savior of the world. He is going to take Mary and they're going to go and he's going to become a father. And, 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 and it's being done in the fullness of time, right? That the, the, this woman gives birth to the son who's going to take away the sin of the world and And Joseph can't see all of that playing out. Just as you and I are living in an unprecedented time, we can't see everything that's playing out. But what does Joseph do? What does the scripture highlight? What does the scripture tell us? He was a just man who didn't want to put her to shame. As he pondered these things, it tells us that he's focused in well on the right decision. And that's what I want you to see right now as I say that to you. You and I are living in what seem to be unprecedented times for our lifetime. We've not seen this before. It seems life-altering on so many fronts. But here's the thing. We don't need to fret over these things that we can't control. Instead, we have the opportunity to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ in our lives and stand firm on that solid foundation, no matter what comes our way. This is what Joseph had been doing. This is what he does in this moment. And the scripture highlights that for us. In the midst of this cosmic movement of God, it highlights how Joseph responded when the unprecedented occurred. So what are you doing today? What are you doing on a daily basis to build your character on the foundation of Jesus Christ? Let's look at the second thing we see when we have a decision to make. uh, The second thing we we see is that we have a decision to make. When the unprecedented occurs, we have a decision to make. Look at verses 20 through 25. It says, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. I want you to notice two things here that are very simple. it's, It's two things, fear and faith. Fear and faith. Let's look at fear first. Notice the challenge to not be afraid to move forward with his plans to take Mary as his wife in verse 20. Verse 20b of Matthew chapter 1 says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived to her is from the Holy Spirit. You see, when you experience the unprecedented your first, your first and most natural reaction will be fear. And fear is not always a bad thing. I know we talk about fear and faith, and I'm going to keep doing that here. But fear is not always a bad thing. It's a sign of caution to us. Joseph is naturally afraid to take Mary to be his wife. Because one, he, he, he probably doesn't think that he can love this child. Two, the shame culture of the Near East would put a mark on his name forever. Three, he, he's concerned probably what others are going to think. And four, what, what, if he, what if he meets the man who took what was his? He might, he might just kill the man. Joseph is afraid in so many ways. See, when the unprecedented rears its head, it causes fear. So how much fear have you been living with? The, the more you're watching the media, the more fear is being fed to you. 
People are trying to make a living by creating fear in your life so that you'll pay them to fix your problem. And this is what I'm getting emails from guys and, you know, not people I know, but like marketers about trying to create fear by this course so you won't be afraid. I mean, that's just what people do. They play on our fears. Notice what the angel of the Lord says first to Joseph. He says, Joseph, son of David. When fear comes in, I want you to remember your identity. Remember your identity. Pastor Chris and I were talking about this on the phone this week. We were just talking through. We're both preaching. We're comparing our notes. And he goes, man, this son of David deal, his identity, it helps him move forward in faith. And I'm like, man, that is an excellent, excellent point. I'm sure Joseph is thinking, one, how do you know my name? And two, how do you know my lineage? And each of these phrases is pregnant with great meaning. Pun intended, by the way. You see, when you are anchored in your identity in Jesus Christ, you don't have to be afraid. So I want you to hear some encouragement today. I have this, I have this great little book. It's called God's Promise for Your Every Need. God's Promises for Your Every Need. Given to me by a good friend uh, just as a special gift. And I'll use it when a situation comes into my life and I'll look up and it's just full of scripture or I'll, uh, uh, someone needs encouragement situations happening in their life, I'll find something from this book and send it on to them. This is how the table of contents is laid out. What do you do when you are experiencing fear? Go to page 122. Or mentally disturbed, 127. In need of courage, 131. In need of patience, go to page 139. So it's God's promises for your every need. So I'll just flip on over to one of these pages and see it's full of scripture verses on this particular topic. Here's what we need to do when we're afraid. And it's what Joseph did. Based on our identity and the word given, Joseph responded in faith. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is from the Lord, from the Holy Spirit, right? And so the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God, speaks the word of the Lord to Joseph's heart. When we're afraid because of our identity in Jesus Christ, we need to open the word and let the Lord, through the power of his Holy Spirit, speak his word into our lives. We need to receive the word. And receiving the word is acting in faith. And that's the second thing I want to just remember in this section. We have a decision to make. So when fear rears its head, we have to hear the word and respond in faith. Look at what the angel of the Lord said to him. Verse 20b and 21. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. See, the word of the Lord came to Joseph so that he could move ahead with his covenant with Mary, because what had happened to her was from God. The word of the Lord came to Joseph to help him see the bigger picture of what was taking place, that Mary was chosen by God to give birth to the one who will save the world from their sins. The word of the Lord came to Joseph to help him fear not, but to step out in faith because God was at work. And that's what we want to and need to experience today. We need the word of the Lord. Friend, are you afraid? If you're afraid, you need to to turn to the word of the Lord. You need to open the word of the Lord. You need to receive the message of the word of the Lord. Messages like this, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Psalm 91, verse 1, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Friends, we don't have to be held captive in fear. We don't have to fall into fear. Receive the word of the Lord and walk in faith. This is what Joseph did again and again and again. And I want you to notice something with me for a moment. 
Notice this in Joseph's life. That which was unprecedented actually will become common. That which was unprecedented, the angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream, will actually become common. I'll show you that in just a moment. Here's the third thing I want you to see today. When the unprecedented occurs, we should look for the next right step. We should look for the next right step. When the unprecedented occurs, look for the next right step. Look at verses 24 and 25. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. His next right step was to act in faith on the word that was given to him. So what did he do? He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Now notice again, this is unprecedented. This angel appears to him in a dream and tells him what to do. But notice if you keep reading, if you get into chapter two, you're going to see this actually becomes very common for Joseph in this unprecedented season. Look with me at chapter two of Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter two, we're going to look at verses 13 through 15. Remember the star emerges, it it shows up, the, the magi, the wise men see it, they start to follow the star, they come to Herod, they're saying, where is he born king of the Jews? We, Jews, we saw his star in the east and we came to, to worship him. Herod starts to hunt this child, wants to kill him. Notice verse 13 and following. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. What happens? The unprecedented. The angel appears to him in a dream. This is number two. Get up, go do this, and stay there till I tell you. In other words, I'm going to talk to you again. And what does Joseph do? Immediately, he gets up at night and they flee. Now, notice verse 15. It shows us this. And they remain there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. This is the night right next step, and they remain there. Here's the thing. Some of you may have been moved into something new, different, and challenging, and it's not, it's not what you're comfortable with. It's not what you know. It's Egypt when you're from Israel. Joseph's already moved from Nazarene down to Bethlehem, has the baby. Mary has the baby. They're kind of making a home for themselves there. And suddenly they got to get up and move. And suddenly you've had to get up and move for some reason, somehow, maybe it's your work or something else. And you find yourself in a foreign land, it feels like, in in an awkward spot. And you're trying to take the right next step. And yet the Lord's not releasing you. He's not letting you do that. You know what you need to do? You need to remain there until he tells you otherwise. You need to bloom where you're planted. You need to to dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness, Psalm 37, verse 3. You need to, to make the most of the season you're in. God knows where you are and where you need to be, and he knows when and how to move you. And so I would encourage you to focus in on the word of the Lord and say, Lord, what's my next right step. Notice, again, once again, the unprecedented becoming common. Look at verse 19 through 21. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. See, that's happened. It's the third time, right? Saying, rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. So the word comes, he gets up and he acts on it, right? The, the word comes, so the unprecedented is becoming common. He gets up and, and we're going to get out of the land of Egypt and we're going to go up to Israel. But notice a fourth time, again, the unprecedented becoming common, what happens? Look at verse 22, verse 23. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. You're in Egypt, you go north to Israel, but Judea is the southern kingdom, or Judah, but this whole region of Judea is the southern kingdom. There's there's Jerusalem and Bethlehem. He was probably going to go back to Bethlehem, but he hears that Herod's dad, or Herod, uh, Herod, Herod's son is ruling over this region. He's like, I don't think that's right. So the angel appears to him and he says, hey, hey, 
Let's go uh, look at it. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there and being warned in a dream. So this is the fourth time he withdrew to the district of Galilee. In other words, they went north. And then it says, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Again, it's the fourth time. That which was uncommon, or that which was, was unprecedented, has now become, become common in his life. And this is how the angel of the Lord led him. And then you get to the end of chapter 2, and Joseph raised his family in Nazareth. So he, he, he got out of that season after what was to be accomplished was accomplished. I, I have a, a pastor's group that... Uh, we're on a call every Tuesday afternoon. It's guys from all over our city. It's about 14 of us and seven or eight, nine at 10 at a time we'll jump on depending on our different schedules. And, and um, one of the guys, we were talking about 2021 and what we're thinking, how are we planning? And one of the guys says, you know, I usually have one big initiative each year and we go one big idea all year long. He said, but all I can see is like this one big idea for three months in 2021. In other words, beyond the first three months, he goes, he literally said, I think we will have lived 12 months in that first three months of 12 of 2021. I, I've got one idea. I can only see this far. I actually had already been preparing this word. And so I said, I said, man, that's the right thing. The right next step. We can't fret over the steps we can't see, but we can seek to navigate the next step. Then another pastor chime in. He goes, you know, I think God is doing something new. I think God is doing something new. And he referenced Isaiah 43. See, as we come to the birth of Jesus, God is doing something new in that day and time by which we now divide the calendar, B.C. and A.D., by this moment. God was doing something new then. It was unprecedented. God is doing something new now. It's unprecedented. We'll get through it. We know how to navigate it. Stand on the strong foundation we've been laying, our character in Jesus Christ, right? We're, we're to, to um, believe that God's doing this new thing and, and, and walk in that. But notice this word in, in Isaiah 43. Remember not the former things of old, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Friend, I believe we have this opportunity to see God do something new. And we just have to believe in faith. He's doing that. So may we be a people who have a strong foundation of Jesus, who aren't captured by fear, but move forward in faith and who seek to hear the voice of the Lord so that we know what is our right next step. Join me in prayer. May our Lord bless you and keep you. May our Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Once again, if you're a guest, please text the word CONNECT to 797979 so one of our team members can reach out to you this week. If you'd like more access to information and Christ-centered content, we encourage everyone to check out the video description for links to our social media accounts for the City Rise Network and each of our campuses. Additionally, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel and our Apple podcast linked in the video description below. Every like, follow, and subscription helps our message of the hope found in Christ gain more attention in the social media algorithms. So your help in building our audience is an easy way to help our ministry in our city and the world. Before we go, let's pray. God, thank you for just a great day of worship together. We thank you for the freedom we have to gather, for the technology that allows us to do this um, online. We pray that you would use everything we just experienced together to make us more like Jesus. We love you, God. We thank you for your son. In his name we pray, amen.